Hi, welcome to Bookmark. I'm your host, Don Noble. Today's guest is Dennis Covington, whose study of Appalachian snake handlers, Salvation on Sand Mountain, was the runner-up for the National Book Award. Now, Covington has written Revelation, a search for faith in a violent religious world, a narrative of his travels in Turkey, Syria, even Juarez, Mexico. Please join me here at the Alabama Booksmith as I talk with author Dennis Covington. Dennis, it's good to see you again. Good to see you, Don. It's been oh, a number of years, but I remember our last conversation really well. We were sitting uh, up on the second floor of the uh, Birmingham Southern Library, and you had just published with great success Salvation on Sand Mountain. And I don't think when we spoke that it had gotten all the way to a finalist for the National Book Award. Yeah. But it but it was, it did. <laughs> it did. That book really worked. And I looked at that show <clears throat> afterwards, and it was about danger and faith and snake handling and the Bible and the, one of our one of the last moments in our show I was talking about the biblical verse that suggests snake handling and I and also we we're talking about the Holy Ghost and uh, and the biblical verse was from Mark 16th chapter of Mark yeah and what does Mark tell us to do uh, that essentially that believers shall do a number of things uh, and one of them will be to take up serpents and uh, they can also drink any deadly thing but it says that if they drink any deadly fun thing it won't harm them so not many of the handlers actually drink strychnine although some of them do and but, I being a, a wise guy I said Dennis might this have been a, a metaphor Mm -hmm. And you said, what? <laughs> you said, it, it says. says. <laughs> they shall take out the serpents. I mean, there's no, you know, a literal interpretation of the Bible is what they believe in. I mean, it's not really an interpretation at all. <laughs> now, of course, there's some verses like, if your eye offended, it shall be plucked out or something that they don't do. But certainly the serpents. Well. And I, <clears throat> I was pursuing you in my agnostic way about mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. Yeah. But it was not, it was not a um, debatable subject for you on that day. You were filled with it. Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. What did it feel like? A little like what it's starting to feel like now, just talking to you again. <laughs> Why is that? I mean. Uh, you know, my faith has been uh, feeling a bit poorly lately in the intervening years, uh, but I still, I still believe that that's how God comes to us in the form of a spirit. I believe He's in this room. I believe we can reach out and touch Him if we wish. Uh, but I have a lot more uncertainties than I had certainties back then. At the end of your book. Yeah, you had pursued, you had gone from church to church. You'd, some people think it's an Alabama book, but it's not really an Alabama. I mean, you, you march up the sure. Appalachians. You're, you're, some of those churches are in Tennessee. You go as far as North Carolina and Virginia, don't you? Yeah, and West Virginia in particular. Yeah. And they are hard up there. Oh, are they? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, they, uh, when they get television, they'll have other things to distract them, and this won't, it won't be as important. Yeah. But... <clears throat> At the end of the book, you took up a serpent in a mm -hmm. church service, mm -hmm. and then you promised your family that you would not do a dangerous thing like that again. <laughs> Am I right? Well, more or less, <laughs> yeah. yeah. But now you have, you have made repeated trips to the most dangerous place on earth, I would guess. Mm -hmm. Well, you say Juarez, Mexico, maybe the most dangerous city on earth. Why, back when I was. Yeah, you on, know, on, during your visits. And then, yeah. of course, the Syria-Turkish yeah. border. Things have changed. You, you also moved. Let's just 
get that? Why you moved to Lubbock, Texas? You live out in the desert. Uh, well, somewhere. not the, the desert, the high plains. Uh -huh. Yeah, but the flattest place on earth. Oh, yeah. okay. And I've come to love it. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's different, a lot different from Birmingham. Although I still love Birmingham. I mean, I, I come back here and I know I'm home. You know. But your <clears throat> your description of your life out there is uh, is sort of. Um, Old Testament prophet in the wilderness. Yeah. I mean, you, you, the house you were in, how was it for heating and plumbing and what have you? Well, it, was, it had been abandoned, so oh. it was missing some crucial <laughs> elements. Uh, but it was one of the happiest times of my life. And my younger daughter lived with me out there for a while. Uh -huh. um, I homeschooled her in her last uh, year of high school. and. It was, we were so close to nature, and we watched sunrises and sunsets, and we, mm -hmm. the animals were all around. Right. Now the rattlesnakes could get into the house. You know, I had to kill one in the living room one time, and uh, there were scorpions and this kind of thing, but yeah. About it, the rattlesnakes, <laughs> yeah. there are directions for that. Uh huh. Take up. <laughs> no, 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 as I said, my face had been feeling a little poorly, you know. The, the, the text, and, and uh, you know, uh, this is all lots of fun, but the text, Take Up Serpents, is, is in a sense the spinal column of Salvation on Sand Mountain. Uh -huh. And I think that the text that you repeatedly return to in Hebrews yeah. is the spinal column of Revelation. Right. And this text from Hebrews is about this search for faith. Yeah. And I don't understand it, but you do. So tell me about yeah. the Hebrews text and about what you're, you're redefining and you're researching for, for faith. Yeah. Uh, essentially, Hebrews 11.1, 1, in the King James translation, not in others, but, but King James, if it was good enough for Jesus, you know, it's good <laughs> enough for us. Right. Uh, defines faith, as far as I'm concerned. Faith is the substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen. Now, it's that word substance that I have not ever been able to shake. Instead of faith, we loosely think of it as being belief, another word for belief. Right. But what if it's not? What if it is instead a tangible substance, something you can hold in your hand? Okay. And that's what I was looking for over there. Now, why did I look for it in the middle of a a terrible, terrible war, because I think that's the best place to look for it, where people are suffering. And I quoted uh, Kayla Mueller, the young humanitarian aid worker, American who was, you know, kidnapped by ISIS and then raped and brutally murdered by them. She had said in a note to her father prior to her going over there that uh, some people find God in church. Some people find God in nature. Some people find God in love. I find God in suffering. The suffer, suffering is, you know, I, I don't think there's an answer. To, this is not mathematics, but yeah. are we talking about the sufferer or the act of suffering or the observance of suffering or, the, or, the, or people trying to ease suffering. I mean, how, 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 what did she yeah. mean, do you think? What do you mean? Well, I think it's a combination of those things. But, you know, Jesus insisted that his disciples go and watch him be crucified. So there is that element of simply being a witness. But in the process of witnessing suffering, we're also entering the suffering of others. And I think that's as pure a definition of uh, Christianity as you can get. I mean, that's Jesus's gospel, to enter the suffering of others. In the process, one would hope one could help alleviate the suffering. And that's where I felt short. Uh, I was there to witness, but I didn't do anything for anybody, you know. What, what, I mean, I mean you, you may have a penchant for this kind of <laughs> remorse, but, but what could you have done? What, what was there to be done. 
be distributing food and water? Is that the kind of thing you're talking yeah, about? Sure. I mean, uh -huh. uh, I mean, there's so many people who are over there who really are helping right. those. Uh, but I saw my role as simply to give my fellow countrymen a, a point of entry into it to see what was going on. You know. You're, you're bearing witness in your bearing own witness. in your own way. Right. There was a there's a conversation that you you have on an airplane headed for Turkey with a woman who was originally from Azerbaijan or someplace. What <laughs> Kyrgyzstan? <laughs> where uh, where was she from? Uh, Kyrgyzstan. Kyrgyz, Kyrgyzstan, I think. Kyrgyzstan. It's, it's, and yeah, I'm not, and uh, you're talking about she, you and she were. You were, seat, you were seatmates, and this happens. <laughs> so right. you're talking about what you were going to be doing. And you told this woman some stories about your brother Gary. Mm -hmm. And her remark at the end of that interchange, which you've chosen to keep and put in the book, was you want to do something, <clears throat> take care of your brother. Yeah. And if you're looking for faith, why don't you just take care of your brother, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And those are wise words. No airplane trips were required for that. Right. Well, that's true. Yeah. And you do, I mean, it isn't as if you don't, because you do take care of Gary. I mean, the, the book is laced with the stories of your childhood with Gary. You're intervening in his times of greatest need. You're, yeah. you're finding him suitable places, suitable help, suitable places to live. What, what do you think she meant? I mean, I think that's a metaphor, by the way. Uh -huh. <laughs> kind of like taking up snakes, I think. Uh -huh. Well, what, don't you? Do you think that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, she was an aid worker uh -huh. in Afghanistan. I also think she was a spy, but don't let anybody know that. But uh, she, she spoke too many different <laughs> languages. and uh, She probably was. Yeah. Th that part of the world, Omar, Omar? Uh -huh. Oh, surely. I mean, Omar, everybody's working for somebody. Right. Except you. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and you can't yeah. say. No, I'm not, I wasn't working for anybody my, myself. But uh, you can't trust <laughs> anybody over there. And I, that's a lesson you learn very quickly. It's, it is a mystery within a mystery within a mystery. Uh, well, let's look at some of the bits of the mystery. How, you, you set a chapter, and then you refer to it, you go return to Juarez uh -huh. a number of times. In Juarez, everybody's Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Some of them are criminals. <clears throat> Some of them are, <laughs> I love it that you actually say lunatics, because yeah. we're not supposed to say, there, these are now people who are just uh, mentally different. Yeah, well, that's my, um, my friend <laughs> Chuck Bowden. That's what, <laughs> what he called them. They are uh, lunatics. Yeah, he, he's, he died like uh, a couple of years ago. But he uh -huh. was the one who introduced me to that whole world, and he's an extraordinary writer, Charles Bowden. How does, the, how does the drug cartel, the violence, the murders, the assassinations, the killings of politicians and judges and reporters, how does that fit <clears throat> in, in, in the exploration of faith? All those people are Roman Catholic in Juarez. They're, they, they don't have a doctrinal dispute yeah. to speak of, but they're killing each other. Well, there's a lot of killing. How, 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 in your head, though, there's a kind of orderliness. Well, not orderliness, but just connections. There are connections there. Right. Well, there's some of them. Some of the drug lords and their followers and so forth actually worship uh, Santa Muerte, uh, the Saint Death. You know, they have roadside... Uh, uh, worship sites along highways uh -huh. and so forth, and they think of their people like Chapo, you know, the head of the Sinaloa cartel, as being a saint. You know? They do. Yeah, because oh. he provides for the people, I mean, in these small Mexican towns. So you've got that kind of religion up against the more traditional Roman Catholic right. Church. But the Church itself gets... Uh, I mean, yeah, I where does this fit? <laughs> I, I, I mean, in order to survive, uh -huh. I think the church sometimes has to cooperate with the uh, with the cartels. Well, they have all it, the power and all yeah, the menace. Yeah. It's life versus death, more than being like 
Islam and, and uh, Christianity or something. It's just, this is a gospel of life, this is a gospel of death in Mexico. Is, is there, this has not, not occurred to me, I mean, I, I remember the phrase, the muerte, but, but I, I didn't think of these Mexicans as somehow akin to Santeria or voodoo or what, but apparently yeah, there, there is, there is a, that a, a connection there, huh? Oh, yeah, particularly some parts of Mexico, it's, it's extremely severe, and, oh. and I, I wouldn't give you an example. I would be tempted to, but not on the air. I always think of it as uh, Haiti or New Orleans, yeah. Jamaica, places in the Caribbean and, and <laughs> New Orleans. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the bulk of your book is re reporting from, <clears throat> well, this, basically the Turkish Syrian border. Yeah, and Antioch. And Antioch where, is on the Turkish side. Right. It took me a while to get a hold of that. Yeah, and it's right. about a 20-minute drive uh -huh. to the Syrian border. <clears throat> and Antioch, of course, is where Christians were first called Christians mm -hmm. and where St. Paul set out on his mission trips to the wider world. So it's a special place to begin right. this search for the substance of things hoped for, and especially since right across the border you've got the substance of things you don't want. You've got the worst uh, world, you've got the worst war in the world and yes. the worst humanitarian crisis of our century sitting right there at the doorstep. And I had to, you know, I had to go in there a few times and I'm happy to be alive. And uh, you're not going back? No, no. No, they, we had this conversation about snakes last time, but we, no, <laughs> this no. time... We're... No, I, I can guarantee you. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm glad. And the places where I went are being bombed by Russian warplanes, which is just unbelievable. Yes, yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it really is. Asats, the town, the first town I went into uh, alone was bombed yesterday. Kids were killed in yes. hospitals and stuff. Religion in that part of the world if there were, <clears throat> if there were, if the strife were organized along the lines of Islam and Christianity, I could almost imagine it, but it's not exactly. I mean, all the, the, the Sunni Shia thing makes me crazy. I can't figure out why people who seem to have about 99% of everything in common are so determined to kill each other. Right. A dispute that is, of course, 1,600 years old, but right. nevertheless, did, yeah. did, you, did you finally have a moment you said, ah, I think I understand that? No, I never did. And uh. in ways, <laughs> I think it's been blown totally out of proportion. I uh -huh. mean, Syria was a secular state, uh -huh. you know, very much like Turkey, uh, a secular country, although now uh, Erdogan, the, the uh, leader of Turkey is really turning it more and more into a theocracy. But, um, and I don't, I think that the religious split is simply being used for the usual reasons. What are wars about? Wars are about territory. Mm -hmm. They're about money. They're, you know, the religion just, I don't think it's as important as it sounds like to us over here. But I may be making a terrible error. Well. You've been there half a dozen times, so mm -hmm. I mean, you have a you 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 know something about it yeah. firsthand. Talking to people who talk, talk to you, well, that, obviously you couldn't learn uh, Arabic, Turkish. I tried. Oh. oh gosh! But translator having translators around all the time must have been uh, to me. It would be just terribly difficult. Yeah, and my translator happened to be the worst in the world. <laughs> and also the worst driver, so <laughs> it made it uh, made it a little rough. Your translator could get you killed in two different ways. Exactly, yeah. But he saved my life, you know, once, and he also saved me a, a, a thousand buck fine and not being able to go back into Turkey for three years. Um, uh huh. You know. And we're thanking him for this, getting you back into oh, Turkey. Oh yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Who is the yeah. audience for this book? I, 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 that's, I mean that in a, you know, one reads, and you think, all right, now, Dennis has written this book, and there's somebody out there that he has in mind that is the reader. Is it a, is it a, 
are we going to see this book in Christian bookstores because it's a search for faith? Are we going to see it um, uh, disparaged by Christian spokesmen because it's of uncertain faith? Or who is it? Who do you, who do you want to have read the book you know, besides everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me put it this way: I never saw Salvation on Sand Mountain in a Christian bookstore. Never. <laughs> so that's, a, I mean, if that won't go into a Christian bookstore, uh -huh. then certainly this one won't go, okay. in particular because of the language of some of the sins yes, sure. and the violence and so forth. Uh, it's not, I was glad that the uh, Publishers Weekly, whoever reviewed it, uh, described it as a memoir, because I think it's really a memoir. It's a memoir oh, it of is. a writing, uh, of, a, of, a, of a, an old man, essentially, who's going and taking a sort of a different uh, path. You know, war has always interested me, and I covered the war in El Salvador right. some, and uh, I wanted to go to the first Gulf War, but the editor of the Birmingham News, uh, bless him, he uh, said, don't you think you're a little uh, long in the tooth for that? I mean, I was in my early 40s, ah, but I think he yes. thought I was maybe a little old <laughs> to go do that. So this passion, I knew then, when I wasn't going to be able to go to the first Iraq war, that Syria was likely to be the next candidate. Mm -hmm. And I tried to learn some Arabic because I, I saw it coming in the future. I had no idea that the Arab Spring was going to happen or anything like that. And, uh, it is important, and you, you mentioned this several times in the book, as, as people do. Uh, uh, there's a, there's a new book uh, by Engel, Richard Engel, just came out today. Wow, about his kidnapping and everything, or about the whole? Uh, about the uh, war the, yeah. in general, but it is important, of course, that people know what's going on. Mm -hmm. It's important that there be cameras and tape recorders and, and eyewitness accounts and so on. And you felt that because you did it. There's a difference. But we know a lot now, but nothing changes. Yeah, that's true. Well, yeah, I went as an Alabama redneck. What would happen if you put an Alabama redneck right there smack in the middle of a war in a Middle Eastern country that he had never been in, with no official reason for being there? I wasn't, I wasn't, on, I wasn't a stringer for anybody. I wasn't mm -hmm. working for a magazine. I just, a book publishing company had taken an enormous risk. Uh, but I had already been into, uh, over there before I got the contract. In other words, what I'm saying is, all I've got are these eyes, these ears, and a brain that is largely uh, demented by now. But what would it be like for an ordinary American like me to do so, that? So it's a memoir, it's a travel narrative, yeah. It's an eyewitness, it is a witness of, witnessing of the events, and you were lucky to get out alive. Sure, yeah. And you did get injured. Yeah. Vacuum bomb? Concussion? Will, what? 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 I what have no idea happened? whether it was a vacuum bomb. I, I know they're being used over there. But there was an explosion as we were coming out of the great mosque of Aleppo. Yeah. And it was the loudest thing I'd ever heard. Yeah. And nobody around me seemed to be affected by it. Of course, they're in the middle of a war. Uh, and I knew that something had broken inside my head. I knew it the minute it happened. And, and I was disoriented. I was uh, I clearly affected by it. And everybody who I saw after that, I, they would say, well, how was it in Aleppo? And I would say, well, it's something broke in my head. And nobody mm -hmm. understood it. I went to the emergency room in Texas when I got back. They put me in the uh, psych unit. Uh, didn't give me a CAT scan or anything. Uh, and then a couple of months later, it was clear that I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. And a colleague of mine, insisted that I go to the emergency right, room. Right. And they did a CAT scan and there was a pool of blood on my brain. You had a capillary or some tiny blood vessel that burst as a result of the bomb. Yeah, I think that's the best way to explain it. I mean, uh, that's the only thing I can I mean, there, if you had had a, an annual, a tiny 
capillary aneurysm, mm -hmm. you had a stroke. Yeah. And now they have gone in, drained the blood, put your head back together, yeah. and you'll write another book. Yeah. We only have 30 seconds. What are you going to write another book about? Franco in Texas. I think that uh, the dictator <laughs> of Spain came to Texas in 1917 uh, in order on a secret mission to uh, give speeches in Spanish along the Me uh, Mexican border that would help prevent Mexico siding with Germany during the war. And I've done a lot of research. Such a thing is recorded as having happened. Oh, I love it. Yeah, but it, there's not enough to do it as a non, completely non-fictional book. So I'm going to try to do it as close to the facts as I can and then make it a little hybrid, put some fantasy and some uh, oh, yeah, ideas sure. into it. Oh, yeah, sure. It'll be a historical novel. Yeah, about more or less. Fra about, Fra Franco. about Franco. I like it. I mean, I, I'm going to read it. Okay. <laughs> I will. I'll get a copy. And they'll get right at it. Then good luck with the rest of the tour. Thank I hope so much. Revelation is a great hit, like Salvation on Sand Mountain. And uh, I'll see you again, I hope, okay. before so long. Yeah, it's so good to see you.